Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. So today we are honored to have um, Robert Sandusky here. He's a collaborator of um, Harold Nelson and he'll be taking some of the questions that we had originally come up with for Harold. Harold will be back next week answering the same questions and we'll find out how the answers differ. Um, so we're going to ask five questions to Robert. Actually, I'm going to add one more question about Harold. I would like to talk talk about him behind his back a little bit. Yeah, um, that's and, good. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then once we've done that, we are going to have more get more questions for Robert, and then we head out into the breakout rooms discussing what is the way forward for each of us. Okay. When we, come, when we come back, we will share our answers to that. Robert will answer some of the questions uh, that you put on the table and we'll go from that. All right, Robert, so first question, how do you know Harold and how long have you known Harold? What's, what's your history? How long is the hard one to answer there? Cause I don't remember, and I don't think he does either when we first met, but to be brief, uh, I was working for the forest service in San Francisco and their architectural group, which turned out to be very much like any architectural office. I took the job uh, coming out of the army, not knowing what I was getting into. And I thought, well, I'll take this for a couple of years and move on. And I stayed there 30 years. During that first uh, meeting, what happened was we had a summer uh, program for students from Cal. And Harold was getting his PhD in um, social systems uh, in Berkeley and came to work for us because he already had architectural uh, degrees and experience and so forth. And of course we hit it off right away. And uh, it was through Harold's work in Berkeley, his, his um, PhD uh, sponsor was Wes Churchman. And West was uh, very instrumental in systems. Uh, well, the history of systems and the production of uh, systems during the war, he, that's where he gained all of his um, information or his fame. And we used to, Harold and I would go over to Berkeley on Tuesday noons to uh, Churchman's Noon Seminars. Uh, we'd take the bus over and get back to work on, in time. And Churchman had this fantastic group of people that he was connected with, Acoff and uh, a huge list of people. And like the chancellor dropped in to have lunch one day, everybody's eating out of the bag and Churchman would sit there and knit with his needles and look over the top of his glasses and ask a pertinent question and everybody would fall apart trying to answer it. Well, Harold did very well under, as you can tell, under Churchman's tutelage. And he, he stayed in San Francisco after he got his degree for a while. And then he went to work uh, at started his education uh, career in, in, um, Lubbock at Texas Tech and then moved up to uh, Seattle and became Dean of um, Whole Systems Design at Antioch University where he had that position for several years. And then uh, it was during that time in Antioch when he and Eric started the book. Uh, Eric was also a churchman person. He, we met him through the uh, ISSS, which is International System Science Systems yes, yes, System Science Society ISSS. Anyway, I, that's where the three of us got together, and we formed the Advanced Design Institute, and then the book came out of that. 
Wonderful. All right. So the first, second question for you is, what do you think, what do you make of our meetups? You know, what's the experience? You've been familiar with this book for a long time. You've seen different people go through it. What, 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 what do you think of the meetups? You've been participating in all, all these meetups. What, what do you make of them? Well, first of all, I think the participants are fantastic. Every one of you is. I'm always anxious to come to the meetups, believe it or not. <clears throat> and one of the main reasons why is because, and, and this is true for Harold too, but I'll let him answer for himself, is the feedback we get is uh, of use to us in our own development of design. And it's like having a built-in design team here, if you will, and everyone's offering their opinions unabashed and uncensored, and we all are on the same level and take it all in at the same time and process it in our own different ways. And that is truly valuable because there's no other place where you can, A, get an audience about design. You try it. <laughs> it's real hard to do, except in a university setting where, you know, you have a lecture. But to have, to be able to sit around the fire and discuss design with a group of people, that's pretty incredible and very valuable to me. And I know it is to Harold, too. How is it different from a university setting? Well, when, and that's a good question. The university setting is formal. Uh, even in a seminar, uh, there's kind of this hierarchy and so forth. But for instance, in Churchman's uh, luncheon, it was totally informal. Like I say, he sat there and knitted while people came and went and whoever dropped by and added to the conversation. <clears throat> and when you go to a lecture, you don't have a Q and A, you don't have a breakout, you don't have a response time coming back. And when you're in a seminar in, in the university setting, it's whatever happens in that room. And again, you don't have the same process that you've created here where people get together, different people every time and discuss and come up with a question, but the discussion is never about the question. It's always about something else, which is great. Wonderful. Thank you. Next question was, and these are all the questions that all these folks had come up with last time. We've selected five of them. Um, so the next question is, how do we train the next generation of designers? What do you think about what, what is a good training, good process of training for designers? Yeah. Well, first of all, there has to be uh, an overall arousement in the community about design. And before you can actually uh, teach or train anyone, there has to be an interest in it to begin with. But it's, it's my position, and I think I speak for Harold and Eric too, that we feel like that design belongs to everybody. And we have this talent and the kids in grade school are bubbling over with it. By the time you get out of high school, it's something that only, you know, you don't want to have anything to do with because A, you don't make any money and who cares and so on and so forth. But if we're, if we're going to prog progress, we've got to, first of all, create that, that desire, that arousal uh, in the community and to follow that with the interest in design and develop the idea of a design culture because that's really what it's all about. And like you say, we're designing animals and it's about time we figured that out and started using design in our 
everyday lives and in our political lives and in our social lives, uh, we'd be a whole lot better off if we did, I think. Wonderful. Um, so we'll do uh, just two more. Let's say, can you say a little bit more about culture of design? What, what is the vision of culture of design? Well, to me, culture of design would be like the culture of music. People would design as a vast uh, uh, spectrum of specialties and so forth. But the design, as we use the term with a capital D, is like music with a capital M. You've got all forms of it, but everybody has their appreciation of music. And for me, that's what the culture of design would be like, uh, where people would have not only the appreciation, but the participation in design. And now it's very difficult to participate. You don't participate in your phone from Apple. You might luck out and be on some kind of a forum where they are asking you about the product, you don't get to participate in design, even as a designer. You're the last person that they call when they're ready to do something. As an architect, and particularly when I was working for the government, we were the last persons they came to. Instead of coming to us in the beginning and let us work at it from the beginning, we were always playing catch up and redoing and backing up and starting over. So with a design culture, it would be a different way of looking at it and people would have the, the uh, direction to start at the beginning of the process and work their way down the spiral with us rather than calling us after they pre-designed everything and want, it won't work. Wonderful, I, I like your analogy of culture of music because we know what it looks like, a culture of musicians, yeah. like jazz musicians or a community of musicians. Yeah. You know, I'm very familiar with the kind of the uh, Indian uh, classical music and a robust community. What, what happens is that everybody is bringing their own expressive power. Right. And they are interacting with one another, playing off one another. And in the process, building a far more richer and complex design, you know, music creating ability. And everybody is surprising everybody else all the time. Yeah. And it, it's also a way of communicating that is, you know, everybody grows up with it. When you're, you, when you're a senior in high school, you haven't forgotten all about music. You're totally into it in your garage and everything else. Uh, but design gets cut off early on. No, it's idealistic. That's another thing. There's nothing wrong with design being idealistic, okay? That's what it's all about. <clears throat> wonderful, wonderful. All right, now last two questions. And then we are going to take more questions from other people. We are going to collect the questions and then we're going to go into the breakout rooms. One question, is there one right solution? Uh, that's a good one. The short answer is no, because design is not about solving problems. It's not seeking a solution. It's about creating a response to an issue. So one of the hardest things to do, because we're, we're so locked into find the answer, uh, analyze, find the answer, solve the problem, that it's hard for us to respond to the, the design way uh, and to be able to communicate on that level and to you know, participate in our own way on that level. So uh the answer to the question briefly is no but in terms of um the, the uh you know the larger um environment um it's really unlimited in form mm -hmm. and is indeterminate the more complex the the design uh issues become 
the more complex they are, the more indeterminate they are in the, in the ultimate particular, which leaves you with uh, a, di you know, most, let's say sociological problem. Well, any, any issue, let's say we're designing a car. It never ends. That design of that car never ends because the conditions that it creates cause different uh, responses in the automobile industry and the uh, outside influences cause changes in it. So it's constantly evolving, changing and being reinvented. And that's part of the design thing is that there isn't one solution. There are multiple solutions that will come to bear through the process itself. Wonderful. All right, so I was going to ask you the question about the way forward, but let's keep that when we have everybody else answer the question. So um, folks, now it's time for you to ask additional questions. We're gonna collect all the questions. Okay, some of them we're going to pose, you know, we're gonna have Robert answer. Some of them we're going to save for Harold. Some of them we're gonna have both people answer and then we're gonna compare the answers uh, on YouTube. Um, so that's that's the plan. So go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to put a question on the table. So after all these questions, we're just putting the questions on the table right now. You're going to go into the breakout rooms afterwards and the breakout rooms are going to be moderated by Evanik, Joe and Maritza. And the question in the breakout rooms is what do you see as the way forward for yourself after reading the design way? What is the way forward for yourself? Okay, so that's the question that we are going to all discuss in the breakout rooms. And then we are going to come back, share our answers about that. Robert will answer some of the questions. So that's the format. So now it's time for your questions. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you'd like to put a question on the table. Uh, first up is going to be Joe followed by Maritza. Joe. Um, thank you, uh, Robert, actually, for joining us all these weeks. And uh, you've been in my breakout room a number of times, and it's really been, uh, I've been fortunate to have that uh, happen. Um, in my pleasure. <laughs> it, yeah. um, so, I mean, I have a couple of questions, but uh, one of them, really, I think that it's important to kind of maybe explore a little more is that how would you define design judgment? I mean, because specifically, we, we talked about raising the design judgment to the level of rational thinking and rational judgment in the book. So if you were to give me a succinct def definition of, of uh, design judgment, how would you define that? Okay. Um, well, yeah. no, 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 no answer. Oh, no, no answers. Oh, no answers. Oh, okay. No answers. Good. Not till, just collecting okay. the questions. <laughs> so we only get we we'll only get one question. Questions, all the questions and all the answers uh, to, all together. So we'll, I'll go to my reference. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Design judgment. Okay. Very good. Second question. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the I guess what is. Uh, what is the distinction between a, a culture that's oriented towards science versus oriented towards design? Like, how do those two compare and contrast to one another? Wonderful. Um, I'm yeah. supposed to answer these? No, no. Uh, <laughs> They're going to answer them. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we're <laughs> going to just collect the questions. See, All we right. always think that questions are more important than answers. So we yeah. collect them, we organize them, we, you know, and then we, we get to answer them later. Um, Vanessa, Mike, and David. Vanessa, what's your question? Uh, Vanessa, go ahead. Okay, uh, next up is going to be Mike. Mike A. Yeah, thanks again, Robert. I've been in a breakout room with you uh, several times. Always really enjoyed uh, having you there. Thank you so much. Thank uh, my you. Question, yeah, now my question is, um, 
over all the years that you've been in business or been part of a design team, what are the, the major differences between, say, designing something 30 years ago as opposed to doing something today, especially the influence of technology? How has it affected you personally? Wonderful. So technology, how has it influenced design? Excellent. Uh, next up is going to be David S. David. Have to unmute, there we go. Um, so for need of examples to concretize reading the book, because there's a great deal that feels uh, difficult for me to pin down, not being in an academic design environment. What would you offer as your way to consider this question? Here, you know, this is just a, a model question and how would you approach it from your meta view of design? My, my question would have been this to you, but I think I, I want you to reflect on this. First of all, is the iPhone design? Yes, the iPhone is a design thing. Do you see it as a design of a hand? What, if we say what it's a design thing, what, what do you see as a design of something to run apps and use maps, text and email, share documents, play games, take pictures, and also incidentally, it's a phone, so you can do that. Or do you see it as the design, really a design, expressing the design of a way to get people stuck into a rigid set of behaviors in a manner that forces them through continued planned obsolescence to have to keep paying for things that they need and need in quotes. You know, so it's part of a, you know, it, it can sort of be both, but I, that doesn't feel like the answer. You know, and so how would you reflect that question into a design meta view? What do you see it as? It expresses some kind of design. Excellent, excellent question. Uh, what is iPhone designed for? What is the purpose of the design? So that's what I should have said. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Jang and Laura. Jang. Yeah, actually I have a different question, but uh, after David, I have a change my question. So we were talking about the internet design, you know, how it was designed to hook people up. Like you go to this rabbit hole, instead like, like food. If you're interested in certain things, then they just keep feeding you the same information. That's why we have so many people become so extreme because all they see is confirming your view instead of expanding it. Just like you eat food, you know, you eat apple, then they need to suggest other balanced, but on the contrary, because their goal or purpose is not make you have a balanced view, their purpose make you have unbalanced addictive view so they can charge money. I think that's, you know, how do you see the purpose of design? I think it's critical for internet, you know, their purpose is making money, you know, but for society, our purpose is have balanced society. So this conflict of purpose, who can design a way to make it serve people more than serve the company making money? Wonderful, beautiful question. Um, so I'm gonna take all these questions right now. We'll figure out how to answer them, who answers them, all of that is separate. We're just going to collect questions for now. Okay, uh, next up is going to be Laura followed by Maritza. Laura, what's your question? Okay. Um, when I think about all these things, I mean, I think design is something that is, it has to be inherent to anything that's going to be a decent project, that anything that requires um, something, you know, where you need some systematic way of approaching it, um, many ways could be, but, you know, you have to have some. Um, and I think a good designer is someone who has some inherent liking of ordering things in certain ways. I really do. Um, I can't, it's sort of like it. I remember a guy came into a drawing class and or he had never drawn anything. And this, I thought you're, you're doomed. You know, there's no way in hell you're gonna. And this guy worked none and drew and drew. And he actually, you know, by the end of six months he could make something that looked like a human being. But boy, the effort that he put in just to do that. So I think you can learn things, but 
are you ever going to get to the place where you would say, so I feel that way about design. So that's my one big book. But then the What's other, your question, uh, Laura? I, I want to get to the point that with um, there's, is there a limit to how, you know, the kinds of way we will design things? Do we just um, sort of tweak here and there, you know, okay, we have computers, now we have to think in terms of this, you know, and we're going to start using software. So we think, so we're constantly just sort of tweaking things to fit what we have. And once we get it tweaked, we kind of just keep tweaking some more because our audience has grown a little more sophisticated and needs something else. So, you know, I want to know, you know, how fast or, you know, models, you know, of design change, I mean, or do they ever really change or do we just you know, kind of give the same script for it, but put different stuff into that script, you know, based on, you know, today we're doing things with software or whatever, AI, okay. and sometimes somebody's going to go, oh, but where's humanity in all this? So what do we do? How do we ba walk backwards? Are we equipped to do all of these things? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to put it as, is design, design just continual tweaking of things? Uh, next up, is Maritza followed by Kevin. Maritza. So my question would be on the, the idea of, if we're looking at a design as a whole, how do we, or what are some mechanisms presented if you're looking from a systems thinking uh, perspective, what can you do to ensure that you don't stay stuck. Like, okay, that's a terrible way of phrasing that, sorry. Um, like the, the idea of, you know, it's the goal is for us to perpetually see a whole, but then we also need to keep in mind that it, the whole is a part of another whole. So my question is just out of curiosity for somebody who does come from the background of design specifically, how do we, look from the inner to the outer? How does one manage that in a design setting? Okay, uh, inner to outer. Um, how do you handle the whole, which is part of another whole? Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, next up is going to be Kevin. Kevin, go ahead. Thank you, Sarka. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, my question is simple. Uh, but I'm going to explain later. It's the purpose of a design remains the same. We, because we need tools, the more tools we have and design, the more challenges to ourselves as human being and nature. So you know, from, in other words, from, from fire, stone, phone, internet, that matter words, virtue, and reality get AR, VR, where's human being? Where's ourselves? Thank you. Okay. What's the role of human beings in design? In design. Okay. Very good. Uh, last question I'm going to read out from Vanessa. Um, was this book purposefully a bit vague and even ambiguous at times to actually help guide the reader to an understanding and appreciation for design? which is really customized and personalized for the reader. Okay, very good. That's an excellent, excellent question. Beautifully put. Uh, thank you. So ambiguity and customization. All right, uh, fantastic questions, folks. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to start the breakout rooms. Uh, they're going to run for about 20, 25 minutes. And the purpose, the goal in the breakout rooms is to answer for each person to answer the question, what is the way forward for them after reading this book? And part of your entire journey of design where you know in your life, how do you see yourself using these ideas? What, what do you plan to do with them? So what is the way forward? Okay, so we'll discuss that in the breakout rooms. And then when we come back, we can, uh, we are going to, you know, Robert will answer a few questions. And then I would like to hear from each of you about what you think is the way forward, because I think that's the most interesting thing. 
All right, um, so I'm starting the breakout rooms now. They'll last for about 25 minutes. They're gonna be moderated by Evanique, Joe and Maritza. Starting the breakout rooms now. But that was all that, that design team could know exactly what the other person was thinking and how it was gonna integrate. It was like it was one mind. And that took years to cultivate and create, but it worked. And the same thing happens, you know, I can't tell you innumerable times that the same things happen. Even if it's your own client, you can develop that rapport, that relationship with them. And it's worth all the money in the world because you're working towards the same end, which you don't know what it is but you're working towards it together and supporting. So it, it's a big uh, aspect of the whole thing that most people don't really understand. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. You know, I have a small company and it's exactly like that because what happens is that you kind of, everybody knows everybody else's strengths, yep. and weaknesses. And weaknesses, right. And especially, you know, it takes time for people oh, yeah. to feel comfortable with saying that, look, on this one, you know, Bob here is really. Yeah, really gonna be the lead. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And whereas on this one, you know, I am, I am really good on this. Yeah. And what happens is that there is that give and take of right. saying that you respect strengths, you accept the weaknesses of everybody, right. and understand that you are all working towards the same thing. And then yeah. they both pitch in as needed and it just it's very fluid because and that's that's an, a design environment that you've got there yes it isn't architecture design it isn't blah 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 design it's design yeah. which is bigger than all of the parts and pieces and the interesting thing is that that everybody you know moment you are you have to be honest you know yeah. moment you are honest and you have to really value people who can do do good things so and you have I, you have ahead. to be authentic yes can't yes. can't bullshit you can't try to pull the wool over anybody's eyes and as that team grows together it's not even an issue of course after a while but initially you got to go through all of those rough spots and get all that smoothed out and sometimes it never works right so you kiss it off and <laughs> try something else yeah. i mean it requires the kind of honesty to say you know what on this one i don't think that i can actually figure these things out so yeah. i'm going to ask for help here yeah this person can actually deal with it or you know that look i have tried very hard but this is a genuinely complex thing. i need this yeah. separate pair of eyes to look at it sure you got to uh, check the ego at the door yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and the more sociological, all designs are sociological, by the way, there's not, I don't, whether it's designing a paper clip or the next world war, it's all sociological in some de to some degree. And you have to develop those skills, not only in yourself, but in your group, so that they all can work together and outwardly as well as within their own group. Right. And the leaders need to have that humility of saying, you know what? I have to know what I'm strong at yeah. and I am leading, but there are things that I am weak at. So I but, will look for people who are going to actually fix those things. Yeah. Well, you know, if, if you're a good design leader, you understand one thing, and that's where this responsibility thing comes in. If you're a good designer, you know that the responsibility will be shared by others if you allow them to work with you. But if you put it on them, it's all yours. You bought the whole kit and caboodle. So uh, that's a hard lesson for a lot of people to, to learn as leaders. But you know, design leadership is a surrogacy to begin with because you're working for the client and or the stakeholders or all of the above. So uh, you have to have that 
humility and that uh, understanding and communicate that. People come into a design situation, clients and, and uh, users and, and uh, stakeholders with the concept that they're going to force this down my throat, whatever it is. And you have to get past that to begin with and build confidence and all of those things. So it's, and it, it's ongoing all the way through. Once you get in architecture, when you finally get the uh, design development done, now you got to go deal with the contractor mm -hmm. and you got to start all over again because he's chosen arbitrarily. Most times you don't have any, well, you might have some say in it, but uh, you ha don't have any decision. And so you got to start all over and that gets really sticky really fast because you're handing him a done deal, so to speak. And the first thing the designer or the contractor wants to do is alter it so he can make his living and do his thing. And it's never ending. Yep. Yep. So, um, so Robert, you, um, you, have always been a practitioner right throughout yeah well of course i went to college and got my um uh, i went to university of colorado and got my architectural degree there mm -hmm. and then went into the army and came out of the army to san francisco and but i always say i started designing when i was a kid mm -hmm. and most kids do design like i said before because they're always, their mind's always working and it's dreaming and daydreaming and thinking up ideas and tearing things apart to see how they work. And not everybody's that way, but kids in general are curious and uh, they're not worried about rules, regulations and timelines. No, I wanted to, uh, that's, I, I, it, that observation really struck with, uh, stuck with me, uh, that observation that you made that, you know, kids, when they start out, they are designers, they are continuously doing that. But by the time they are at high school age, it's very rare to find people. Yeah. And that's really sad. You know, it's like, because that's why, you know, I always think of it, you know, us as design, you know, designing animals because yeah. That's what we are. You know, we are actually trying to do things. Absolutely. And we start with the confidence of in our own ability to figure things out and learn, have the curiosity, the application, readiness to fall uh, in order to build that up. Yeah. And, um, so um, now it is really sad that kind of the view of education that is there, it is all screwed up. Like yeah. the way it is taught that the, basically what, what, I don't know what goes wrong. I mean, one part of it is that people hold that you have to be, I, I don't know what it is, you know, because it, it's something really, really wrong with the way in which, because it is, I mean, if you just look at it from, just step back and look at it from a human perspective, right? you're handing this kid over to an institution. You hand it over with this tremendous enthusiasm for life, curiosity, readiness to do things, learn things and transform things and design sure. things. And at the end of it, you get, some, get the same kid back with none of that. Yeah. Something wrong, something yeah. terrible wrong. Yeah, there is. And to my way of thinking, part of it is this idea that it's wrong to idealize. And I can remember way back when I started running up against that. Oh, you're just an idealist. You know, you're not being real. You're not being practical, blah, blah, blah. But if you look at the ideal in the context that we talk about it in design, you know, it's the goal line that you're never going to cross. But every increment towards it that you make is an improvement and is beneficial so why not and if it ideal is unre unreachable we'll get over it because most things in life are that way 
and you can't predict the future and you can't, you're going to have to deal with, uh, you know, unexpected consequences and um, it's just part of life. So if you're in a design mode, that doesn't frighten you. You know that you're, that's part of the milieu that you're in. So you're not afraid of those things. You're a participant and you can interact with them and feel that you have some uh, contact, some way of dealing with it where rather than being a bystander and just hoping it doesn't happen to you or it does happen to you. It was interesting. Like I had, I had some people who are into science education and they, they are, you know, I think the gentleman, uh, it's, it's a couple and both of them work in this in, on comprehensivism of saying, you know, how, how do you keep your mind alive and ready to take on whatever needs to be taken on? And the interesting thing that they said is that when they talk to the science teachers, they realized that all they were peddling, the science people, science teachers were just peddling the results of science yeah. and in the process actually killing the ability of doing science because yeah. science is all about asking questions and yeah. trying to figure things out answers are the results of it and if you say remember the answers don't get the answers wrong yeah do not have the ability of questioning you have no ability to do science you have results right. of science yeah. And that, those are not going to do you any good. And, and science is no different than um, design in the sense that it begins with the inquiry. Yes. <clears throat> Scientists are looking for a truth or, a, you know, not an absolute truth, but a truth. And that's different than a designer because they're not designers thing ain't there yet. So you can't say whether it's going to, you can't analyze, mm -hmm. but um, things are changing mm -hmm. with quantum mechanics. Things are changing. These scientists are getting very creative. Mm -hmm. They're inventing particles that don't exist mm -hmm. and they're trying to find them, etc., to uh, make them real and so forth. So design and science are coming together finally whether they ever make it in terms of getting along we'll see but yeah so now let's go ahead and take some questions so the first question was about design judgment i don't know who asked it was it uh i don't joe. joe joe go ahead and can you state the question again about design judgment yeah. So in the book, we talked about the idea of rational judgment and how there's been a lot of in, in intuition and how the, the, the objective of the chapter specifically on judgment was to raise the level of design judgment to the same level as rational and intuitive judgment. So would, how would you define design judgment within that framework? So, well, first of all, design judgment has to be employed during the design process. <clears throat> you can do it outside of that, but the intention of, of calling it design judgment was based on that presumption that you would be involved in the design process. And when you begin a design, the outcomes are unlimited and you go through the process of deciding what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, where you're going to go with it, and those sorts of things. That's where you start integrating design judgment into your next step or your uh, next consideration. So it isn't just rational and it isn't just intuitive, but it's kind of a link com combination of the two, plus, I guess, a bit of courage in being able to trust yourself and your uh, decisions to go forward with into that unknown that's 
that you're going to be passing through. Does that help? Does that, there's, I don't know of a dictionary definition, so I can't give you that. <laughs> no, that, that helps that you're spanning the two and, and the use of courage, like and embracing the unknown. That, that, that's a, that's a really helpful answer. So thank and you. Th there's one other aspect to it, which Harold talks about a lot, which is Sophia, where you combine right. those two elements and uh, that would be all part of the design judgment, which ultimately leads to wisdom, right, where you make wisdom. wise decisions. Wonderful. Next question is by Mike about technology and design. Mike, can you go ahead and ask your question again? Sure. Uh, it was specifically uh, for you, Robert, for someone who's been in business or the design process for, uh, uh, you know, you've been in business a long time. Do you see or how has the technological advances that have taken place, how has it changed your view of design from when you were designing as when you started as to compare what you're dealing with now? Yeah, that's a, that's my favorite question. And the reason it is because and I can speak for Harold here. When we were first starting out, they came out with this thing called the Apple, right? And we took it in hook, line, and sinker, man. We were total. Uh, I went on to learn basic and, you know, I bought a computer and my kids learned how to use it and how to put the little alligator in to make capital letters and all that kind of stuff. But we had no no technology that would work with design. It wasn't advanced enough. But of course, over the years, uh, graphic design came in to the computer uh, world and boy, that was great. And I was an early adopter to uh, AutoCAD and to Revit. And then there was a huge learning curve. First of all, I took a course from my son who was teaching HTML and I got an A by the way, and still had trouble with, um, you know, coding. Coding was not my thing, but technology was the tool that I wanted to use and needed to use. The tool became more and more advanced to the point where I was the tools tool. I had to work with the tool to get the tool to do the things that I wanted the tool to do. And it, the tool, quite frankly, didn't do a lot of the things that I wanted it to do. So now, last year, I'm with Revit. I'm doing a, a house for my granddaughter and my computer goes bonkers. It just goes non-responsive in the middle of, I'm working on a Revit uh, view and it's quit. Make a long story short, it took me three months not to get that corrected because the, the technologists at uh, Autodesk worked with me for two weeks trying to get it to get my stuff back and we never succeeded. I wound up buying a new computer and upgrading my Revit and so on and so forth. I lost three months screwing around with the tool that was doing me absolutely no good. I could have drawn all of those drawings by hand in three months, <clears throat> but now all of that's invested in the tool and the tool goes bonkers. This has happened to me more than once. I had an issue with my, um, my Apple, I couldn't get it to work. And I wound up going through, you know, my son-in-law's an Apple employee and he couldn't help me. And my son couldn't help me. He's a computer graduate. I finally got a person at Google who said, you know, that's an interesting problem. Let me talk to my supervisor. I'll get right back to you. And she came back and she said, this is great. He's going to let me work on it. I'll see what we can find out. It turned out that there was a flaw in the Google software that I got to show on my computer and they worked it out and corrected it and away we went. That was another two months of going across the street 
to use my computer, my son's computer. The point is, who's responsible? You talk about designers being responsible. Who's responsible? Was that line of code accidentally uh, mismanaged or was it intentional? You don't know, but you're totally at the mercy now of these technologies. And we want to go into AI. Well, I'm old enough that I'm not too worried about that. But as far as I'm concerned, there's a limit. So keep in mind as you go forward that, uh, you know, these things are tools. They're not part of your soul. And you're going to have to uh, fight for your rights and uh, you know, opportunities to use them. Wonderful, thank you. Next question is about the nature of design. Is design just tweaking things that we already have, trying to work with them, trying to make them a little bit better to cope with using multiple of those? Is, it, is design just tweaking of things? Well, the short answer is, Yes and no. Uh, if there's an issue with a, uh, something, whether it's a paper clip or a battleship, you may be in the tweaking mode because you have a given fixed closed system. That'll, let's say it's the battleship. That's a closed system. Now it's embedded, and this is gonna to get to one of the other questions, I think a little bit too, but it's embedded into in a greater system, which is, you know, the ocean and the Navy and all of that. But the battleship has an issue and you don't know what it is. So where do you start? Well, you start designing towards that issue rather than trying to fix this, fix that, follow here, analyze here. You can do both, but uh, it isn't at that point a matter of tweaking. You've got to investigate and uh, uh, follow your intuition. You know, you got a good technician that's running the whatever, and he's got an intuitive idea of what it might be, and you can work together to find it. So it depends on the degree of the design um, issue and what's at stake. All right, next up is question by Maritza. Maritza, I couldn't figure out a way of stating it pithily. Go ahead. Oh man, I was hoping you would because I sure didn't. <laughs> you're, worried about, you're worried about systems as a whole, right? Where do you start? Where do you stop? How do you manipulate how do you systems? Well, right, because I feel like you're you're you need to go in and come out and go back in and come you do. out. But Ab absolutely, I like <laughs> to think of systems as a bubble or a group of bubbles, like a foam, and you're in one of those bubbles, and that's your own personal closed system. But next to you, as you look up, are all these other bubbles around you that are attached to your bubble. So they have influence on your bubble, and but they're not part of your bubble. The skin of the bubble, the surface of the bubble, is where the system is bounded. Your system is bounded, but it's open because it's attached to those adjacent bubbles. And those adjacent bubbles are open to other adjacent bubbles and so on and so forth. But you're in a limited context. You can't go to infinity with all of those bubbles, but you can uh, decide using design judgment and uh, you know, other techniques which adjacent bubbles are important. So you go ahead and, and glom onto those bubbles, but you're also, at that point, you uh, you have an open system because you're still exchanging information and uh, so forth with the other bubbles. <clears throat> but beyond that is this whole environment of bubbles. And you have to stay in design. You have to stay open in your system and through those adjacent bubbles 
to the overall environment because that's where the iteration comes in. You move along and suddenly there's another bubble out there that's attached to a bubble that's going to influence what you're doing and you have to go after that bubble as well. But you don't try to go after the whole ocean unless you want to. Wonderfully put. I, I really like the way in which you know, both Marisa and I were struggling to figure out the way of stating the question, but you, you just oh, zoomed no. in on it, with the bubbles and the cluster of buzz, bubbles. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, last question was from Kevin about, you know, there is this technology, there is AI, and there's all kinds of systems being designed. Where is human being in all of this? How do you, how do you design something which is good for human beings? Well, design is human based to begin with. So no matter what you're doing, you're designing for human beings. Mm. And it, it came to me that um, when I was at the British Museum, they had two artifacts from um, over a million years old. One of them was obviously a handheld axe, a stone axe, but the other one was very mysterious. They called it an orb and it looked like a golf ball with rough ed edges. It was, it was a, a quartz that was um, intentionally rounded with sharp edges all around. And it struck me that that's not an orb, that's not a, a, a artifact of art, that's a hand scraper. And I, being the arrogant guy that I am, called it a self-cleaning hand scraper because you could keep turning the thing around and getting the results on your palm. But the point there is that those two objects were designed. They weren't found. They weren't, uh, you know, monkeys and and uh, chimpanzees use tools a lot. I mean, crows use tools. They'll use a straw to get a peanut out of a cage. But it that orb, somebody sat down started working on a rock and thought about it and designed it into a sphere because it didn't come that way. And one thing led to another and it wound up in its, its form. Now that was in the era of Homo habilis, which was handyman with the uh, pre um, Homo sapiens. So design has been with us since then. It's there, it's genetic, it's inborn. You can't do anything about it except suppress it. And that's what the one of the evils to design is, is the suppression of the design instinct and the design uh, tendency to want to make your environment better for you and yours. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. This, you know, firstly, thank you for Filling in for Harold, uh, just really appreciate that uh, and doing that at the last moment. Uh, I think this was just wonderful to have you here. And folks, Harold will be back uh, next week to answer all the questions. So all the I'm going to ask the same questions I ask, asked um, Robert, but I'm not going to ask him the first question about his, you know, how he came to know Harold. Uh, What's to deny that? <laughs> uh, I want to say please. I want to state to everyone that's part of this because you all are designers you were we didn't make you designers you've been designers now go out and use it and explore it and have fun with it uh, but I want to thank you personally because it, it means a lot to me the things that I picked up just from your responses all the way through. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert, really appreciate that. So uh, folks, next week, uh, Harold will be here. Uh, so please keep your questions coming. I'm just going to give four questions or five questions to Harold to get things started. But then again, like today, you're welcome to ask more questions and we will go, go through like multiple levels of questions. 
because Harold is really interested in what questions we have. So that's probably the greatest value that he, we can give him, the questions. Um, Harold is also writing a new book. He's in the midst of you know, wrapping up the new book. So he's gonna be telling us a little bit about that. Um, he's going to be talking about the way forward. He's gonna be talking about how to train new designers. There's all kinds of great stuff.